Well, good morning. Glad you're here with us as we continue our series on No Regret Living. I mean, it would be great to get to the end of your life and look back and have no regrets. Certainly, that's something worth aspiring to. One of the ways we're trying to make that happen is having a clarifying question that we set out at the very beginning of the series, which is if you only had 30 days to live, how would that change your life today? When you see yourself as having lots and lots of this spare time, it would, you know, it would apply to money too, lots of money. You just tend to be a little more wasteful of it. If you see it as short, you tend to treat it more precious. So that's what we've been doing is looking at our life, saying, hey, let's use our life to the very, very best so we don't have any regrets. And we've been looking at different aspects. Today we're going to be talking about an important subject, which is, Humility, to learn humbly, that's easier said than done, and it's certainly not a value in our culture. I mean, the people that tend to be elevated in our culture are the people that are proud, the people that are arrogant, the people that are conceited. They're the ones that seem to succeed, so why be humble? But God has a high value on humility. If you have uh, a desire in your heart, hey, I'd love to be used by God. You know, I want God to give me an assignment. I want him to trust me with something big. Well, the number one thing God looks for is people that are humble. I mean, that's a valuable thing. And often our understanding of humility is just, it's just flat out wrong. We tend to think of humility as shyness, or we tend to think of people that are humble that just have a, you know, a poor self-esteem. You know, they, 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 they're always talking negatively about themselves. Oh, I'm no good. I'm just a piece of junk. But Jesus was the most humble person who ever lived, and he had a great self-esteem. He knew who he was. He was clear about that. And so instead of seeing humility as, oh, that just means I'm going to be a doormat, the truth is you have to have incredible amounts of confidence, self-confidence, and a high self-esteem to be a humble person. I mean, it takes a lot of confidence. I met a guy uh, this past week. He's got the largest church in America. It's six, he has, his weekend of services are 60,000 people. He's in Birmingham, Alabama. He was going to speak at our regional conference, Chris, Pastor Chris Hodges. And he's done a lot for the church all over the world and has helped our church a lot and has never charged us a dime. When he was going to come to the conference, I mean, we've paid conference speakers in the past. He's the first one who ever said, you're not paying me. In fact, I'm paying my, for my own flight, my own rental car. My, I mean, he was, that's, his, that's who he is. So anyways, I was having lunch with him because he invited us there, our staff team. And I said, you know, Chris, you just, your life, your church, you guys just give everything away. You look for almost nothing in return, really. All you do is you're interested in other churches, other people, other pastors. I go, what, what goes into your mindset? You know, how do you, he goes, you know, I'm just comfortable in who I am. I know who I am. I don't need accolades and all to make myself feel better about me. I can give my life away. So I think that's a good description of humility. You know, Jesus knew who he was. That's why he could get on his knees and he could wash his disciples' feet. When you're going to serve other people, when you're going to do something that is hum humiliating, you know, in, in our eyes, when you know who you are, you can do that. People that, that have this aura that they've got it under control, that the world, they've got the world by its tail, they're the ones that actually have a low self-esteem. So they, they're always projecting something that's not true about them. Somebody who's secure in themselves, that's a different story. Now, God says some amazing things about people that are humble. He says that he saves the humble, that he supports them, he promises to guide them, he gives them wisdom, he rescues them, he exalts them. He honors people that are humble. I mean, you see God doing this all the time in Scripture. He says, I want you to walk humbly with me. In fact, 
the Bible says that pride, he says that he hates pride. That's in Proverbs. He says the seven deadly sins. Right out of the gate, I hate pride. Now, a lot of times we tend to think to ourselves, well, that doesn't really apply to me. I'm not prideful. I don't go around boasting all the time. But listen, that's only one type of pride. There's a lot of kinds of pride that can cause us to get stum- to stumble, to cause us to get derailed. And we're not even aware of it. We know, we, we often know pride in other people because we don't like it. <laughs> but we don't see it in ourselves. You know, it's, it's a, it's, many times it's just a blind spot. But here's what God says. He says, the people I treasure most are what? Yeah, it's the humble. He says, that's a value. Why? Because they trust him. They depend on him. So he goes, this is important. So it's not just what humility is not. It's not being a doormat. It's not having a low self-esteem. It's not being shy. Here's the way I like to define it. Not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of others and acting in their best interest instead of your own. Now, this is not easy to do. It's very hard to do. But this is something we grow in. It's something that God blesses. It's something that God values as opposed to pride. You know, pride is what Satan got kicked out of heaven for. You see, he's thinking of himself. And so it's thinking of others, valuing them. They're important, and it's something we can practice. The truth is, humility is an aspect of love. And so just like love, you can grow in that. And just like love, it's not about a feeling. You might say, I don't feel very humble. Well, it has nothing to do with your feelings. It is an action. You choose to be humble. That's why when you pray, you don't say, God, take pride from me. It's something you choose to give up. You say, I'm going to choose to be humble. So it's regardless of feeling, it's about an action. And so there's things we can do to practice that. Let's look at a few. It says here, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. Practice it. If you've ever learned an instrument, you know, when you first started, you weren't very good. Actually, you sucked. I mean, you were just, right? Everybody starts out that way. You don't sound good. People might tell you you sound good, but you don't. Don't listen to them. But if you practice enough, you start to sound good. You, you grow in that. If, if Some of you are into sports, and you know when you first started with a sport, you didn't do very good. In fact, you were terrible. But as you kept doing it, you got better, and you got better. And this is true for anything that you can practice, and it includes humility, which is an aspect of love. Let's look at that. Here's some things you can practice. Number one, practice giving preference to others. So other people's needs. I care about you, not just me. Now, that's not easy to do. Let me give you an example. This coming week, you might go to the grocery store. Now, if you're like me, when I get my stuff in my cart and I pull up to go through the cash register, I always seem to pick the slow line, you know, and, 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 and then I'm in a hurry. I'm thinking, how did the, it happen again? Here I am in the slow line. And especially with COVID, right, there's six feet between us, and I'm in the long line now, too. And, and, uh, and then, so what happens, let me, let me give you this scenario. What, what happens when you find, you can see they're going to open up another line, okay? Now, everybody else wants that, too, but you can make a choice, right? You can do, go Rambo, right, and just knock the kids out of the way, and I'm getting there first. Right? That's one option. Another option is to, if you're, if you're a lady, you got a ham in the basket or something, you just put the ham under your shirt, you know, and then you, I'm a pregnant lady, I need to, you know, <laughs> kind of lame, right? But what are your options? You can, you, can, you can misdirect people. I think there's a line opening over there, and it's really there, and you run over there. Or you can let other people go. It's hard, though, right? That's, that's, that's a daily thing. What am I going to do? Will I prefer others? Let me give you another example. Let's say you're coming to church, and you show up 10 minutes late. And for some of you, you always show up 10 minutes late. So that's actually not late. You're, you're, you know, you're showing up on time for you. And you, there's only one space left near where you want to park. And, uh, and, you know, the kids are in the back. They've been rambunctious. And there's somebody else who seems to want the same, the same spot. So you're at a decision point again, right? You can gun it, give it the gas, and try to cut them off. Sucka, I got there before you. Or you could put the brakes on, right, let them go. Or you could flip them off, right? 
You go, come on, that's outlandish. Actually, that happened. That's why I threw that in. Sharon was coming to church. This was a few years back. And she was taking a right to go on to the, you know, where the road where the church is. And somebody else was taking a left, and they felt like Sharon should have, should have, um, you know, gave them the right of way. So they were, like, upset. They didn't know it was Pastor Sharon at the time. So she flipped Sharon off. Sharon looks, and then they, they notice each other. You know, then she notices, dang, I'm flipping the pastor off, you know. <laughs> she let Sharon go, and then she didn't even go to church. I don't know why, you know. <laughs> she just, that wasn't the day of church for a church for her. But we each have choices in life, right? And p- putting other people first, that's hard. That's hard. The Bible says give preference to one another. Why? Because we honor them. Because we honor them. You have value to me. You, you know, it, and, and again, in our culture, that's not a priority, but it's something God wants us to march to. And an orchestra, there's lots of instruments. In fact, there's 26 violinists alone, 26 violinists. But you know, there's one instrument, that one, one uh, musician who plays an instrument, when he walks in, everybody, or she, everybody applauds including the conductor. Everybody applauds. And they come in alone, and they leave alone. And both times they get an applause. That's the concertmaster. That's the first chair violinist. There's only one of those then. You have all these violinists, only one gets that. And that's, all the other ones would rather have that, but they're needed for harmonies and all the parts they play. One time somebody asked the famous Leonard Bernstein, who is a great conductor, out of all of the instruments in an orchestra, which one is the most difficult to play? Without a beat, he said, second fiddle. <laughs> There's no fiddle in an orchestra. But he's talking about not playing. In other words, you, you're not going to get that first chair. You get the second chair. And that is difficult to play second fiddle. And we all have to play second fiddle in different parts of our lives, right? Maybe at home, maybe at work. Uh, different places where we're not first, somebody else is first, and we get we get an opportunity to choose our attitude. Am I going to have an attitude of preferencing others? The Bible says, "Practice playing second fiddle." That's in the message. Here's the uh, the Passion Translation. Try to outdo yourselves in respect to, in respect and honor of one another. Another way to say that. In other words, because you have revalue, you I honor you, I respect you. I'm going to give you preference. Notice this in Philippians. It says, don't push your way to the front. What we've been talking about. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. If you're, if you're going to wait until all your needs are met, you won't help anybody. We've done Serve Day for many, many years. And when we first started it years ago, uh, people didn't understand it real well, and they said, well, what, what's serve day? We go and we serve others, I would say. They said, well, like what? I said, well, like one of the things we're doing this year is we're going to go rake people's leaves. And I had one guy once look at me, he goes, why would I do that? I have leaves in my yard. I want to go rake my leaves. I'm not going to rake somebody else's leaves. And you see, that's the, that's the attitude the world has. Many times it's like, oh, if I have needs, I'm thinking of me first. Why would I think of somebody else? But you'll never help somebody because we always have needs. All of us have unmet needs. Think of yourself the way Jesus thought of himself. How did he think of himself? Well, he was God, but he took on the status of a slave or a servant, however you want to translate that, an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless life. He had it all. He gave up heaven to come, and how he was born was you know, in a stable in Bethlehem, uh, excuse me, in uh, Nazareth, which was just a little podunk town that was, in, they were very, very poor there. They lived in caves and in hovels. He just lives w- in a very humble life. He, li- he rides into the, in, when he's going into Jerusalem, most of the, of the uh, Bible scholars of, their, of that day figured that the Messiah would come in on this grand beautiful black stallion and instead he comes in on a little donkey and then he's crucified so i mean you look at jesus's life he lived a life caring for other people but we need each other to make that happen you can't do this on your own what i'm talking about is impossible 
we can all go, yeah, that's interesting. That's okay in another life maybe, but n- not the life I'm living. We, you can't do it on your own. I certainly can't. We need one another to, to spur one another on, to encourage one another. That's why we have small groups. We're not looking to give you another thing you have to do. You need a small group to do the Christian life, to, do, to walk humbly. And you just can't do it because you, it's like you're in a, in a, in a ring. You know, you're out and you're taking some punches and then you go back and you're, oh man, how can I get back in? And you need help. And the way I like to look at it is, here he is, Muhammad Ali, right? One of the greatest fighters, possibly the greatest fighter. This is you. This Angelo Dundee, his trainer, that's your small group. This is you. This is your small group. Ollie wouldn't have done all that well. He wouldn't have won the fights he won if he didn't have his team with him. He needed his team to coach him, to help him. Get back in there. You can do that. Stitched up his eye. Hey, listen, he's keeping his left arm low. Take advantage of that. He's helping him out. And we need that because we are in a fight. It's not easy. Everything in our flesh says, I'm not doing that. Are you crazy? But there's a spiritual part of us that says, you know, the, Jesus talks about the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh doesn't want to do it. The spirit does. We need a team to help us to make the right choices. One of the ways that we can prefer others is by listening to them. So the Bible says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and then slow to become angry. And so not always talking. You know, before we lived where we live today, Sharon and I and our family, we used to live under the flight path in Oceana. Jets coming down all the time. When I first moved in, I thought, uh, this might be hard to sleep, hard to, all, might, hard to, to do things. Always. But after a while, you know, the jet noise, it just kind of went into the background. You move on with your life. It's fine. Except when you're trying to talk to a neighbor or something, and you're just kind of, well, wait till the jet goes by. Now we live near 64 where there's cars always going by. Pretty, you know, it's, you can hear it really well. But, you know, I don't hear it anymore. It's gone into the background. You know, other people hear it, but I don't hear it. If you're talking all the time, you're going into the background. No, you don't, people don't value what you say. You're just always, nah, 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 nah. You, you, the Bible says, be quick to listen. Listen to what other people are saying. Don't just become white noise, background noise. Next is practice learning from others. We all can learn from other people. But you have to have an attitude of humility. A lot of times people don't want to learn from others. You know, they think, oh, I'm so educated. I've got this degree, that degree. I can't learn from other people. That's just pride speaking. Because even if you're educated, you have one narrow bandwidth of knowledge. There's a lot of things you don't know. And you can learn from other people. If you don't just discount them, some people, sometimes older people do that to young people. I can't learn from a young person. I got 30 years on them, 40 years on them. So that's just pride. You can learn from anybody. And there's everybody here knows things I don't know. And if I had some time with you, I could hopefully extract it and learn something, no matter who you are. Young people do that to old people, too. Oh, yeah, they haven't kept up with technology. They don't know the social stuff we're going through. They don't know this, and they discount. I mean, it, it's, it can be pride from a young person, from an old person, educated, uneducated, whatever. When we're going to learn from somebody else, it's learning humbly means putting on that attitude. Here's some benefits that come when you are willing to learn and, and receive correction. It's first thing, you'll be more likable. You'll be more likable. Who likes to hang out with an arrogant person? Nobody, right? real conceited no it's just i don't want to be around you so when we learn from them when we receive correction we actually become likable conceited people do not like to be corrected and they never ask for advice who wants to be around somebody like that the a know-it-all right know-it-alls irritating not only will we be liked but we'll be wiser we actually do learn we we, we get a bigger perspective the, the bible says in the council of many people there is wisdom and so growing in that, we like to say here at the Vineyard that if you're a leader, you're a learner. The minute you stop learning, you're not really leading. You might have some title, but you're not leading. Only le- learners are leaders. So we always want to be learning. If you own a business, you should be reading business books, talking to business leaders. Uh, you need to be growing wiser. If you reject criticism, you're only harming yourself 
You listen to correction. You grow in understanding. So we grow in understanding when we, when, when we listen to people, even if we don't like it. <laughs> the intelligent man is always open to new ideas, and he or she looks for them. Then you'll have less conflict. The truth is, most of the arguments we fall into, there's pride is just fueling that thing. Probably all conflict, all arguments. There's a pride element. And so recognizing that, hey, pride is causing this argument to escalate, to get worse, to distance me. Instead of winning the argument, I want to win the person. I care about the person. That's the difference between pride and humility. I care about you or I just care about winning. And so when somebody starts to get jacked up, they get all angry or whatever, they start yelling, you get softer. That's what the wise person does. That's what the humble person does. Responding gently when you are confronted and you will diffuse the rage of another person. So you help de-escalate what's going on. You don't escalate it. And you can grow from other people's perspectives because we all have blind spots. It is hard to see pride in our own lives. It's hard for me to see pride in my own life. And so how are we, we going to grow? Well, inviting people to speak into our lives. Here's my, I invite you to take this project on. Here's your assignment, okay? You go, Andy, I, I'm not in school anymore. Yeah, you are. You're in school, the school of life. And every time you open up God's word, we're in school. School's in session. And here's your homework. Here's your assignment. I want you to ask somebody today, tell me something that I don't want to hear. That doesn't sound fun. No, we're not, it's not fun, but it is something where God can grow you. And, he, and if you really want to be used by God and receive an assignment by God and him to trust you with some great things, you, we need to grow. And I'm not saying go to anybody. or you know, If you just start going around to anybody, just grabbing people off the street, you'll end up in a puddle somewhere. You know? everybody, you'll think everybody hates you and thinks you're the worst thing ever. No, I'm talking about somebody you honor, somebody you respect. And you ask them, hey, you know what, uh, you know, you probably have to ask them more than once. Because at first they'll go, no, no, you're good, you're fine. Well, you're not. Don't take that. That's not true. None of us are. you got to go, no, no, I really want to know. Tell me one thing. I don't need to. <laughs> Just one. One thing that I don't want to hear. God can grow you through that. Whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus said. Not, he's not talking about being childish. He's saying being childlike. Children want to learn. Little kids want to learn how to walk. They want to learn how to talk. They want to learn about the world around them. Their curiosity is real high. They are interested in learning. He says, that's a good value. Practice admitting when I'm wrong. Now, when I bring up that, I know some of you are thinking, well, that's easy, Andy, because I'm never wrong. <laughs> you know, this doesn't happen to me. But we're all wrong from time to time, sometimes more than we realize. And it's humility that helps us to see that and saying, I'm going to admit when I'm wrong. Reminds me of the lady who, the businesswoman, she went on a business trip for a week, left her husband in charge of the kids to hold down the fort. She goes, I'll call you. And so she does. The first night she calls up and says, how are things going? He goes, well, not too good. The poodle died. She goes, the poodle died. She goes, that's bad. But what's worse is you didn't even warm me up for that bad news. He goes, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, you could have, like, warmed me up, like said, like, the first night, somehow the poodle got on the roof. I don't know how, but he's up there. The next night, say, the poodle fell, and he's injured. I don't know how, he's not doing too well. And then the third night, you could say, the poodle died. That way, it would have warmed me up for that news. She goes, well, I'm sorry, I'll try better, you know. She goes, well, let's just change the subject. I'm in a bad mood now. She goes, how are the kids doing? I know my mom was going to come by and visit, drop by, see how you were doing. And I know you don't really like her very much. How, how's my mom doing? He goes, your mom is on the roof. So. <laughs> Admitting when we're wrong. We're not sugarcoating it, saying this is, this is the way it is. When I was 15 years old, I got a job at a seafood restaurant. I was only 15. I had lied on my application, said I was 16, because that's the only way that I could get the job. And so they thought I, was, I could drive because I was 16. So they came up. They said, Andy, we need you to go take the company truck. It was a little yellow uh, mini truck. And they said, we need you to take this truck and go and do an errand. I said, no problem. So I grabbed the keys. Had never driven before. He asked me, he goes, you've driven, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, this is before I was a Christ follower. Come on now. You know. So I jump in the car, and it's the truck, and it's 
standard transmission, there's a clutch there. I'm going, whoa, okay, got to figure all this out on the spot. So, so anyways, I start backing up, and uh, in the confusion of learning how to drive and all that stuff, I ended up scratching the truck next to me. It was a big white Ford F-150, and this was a yellow truck and just left this huge yellow mark like four or five feet. I just scratched the snot out of this guy's car. One of the other employees, because it was in the, parked in the back of the restaurant. So, so I thought, well, that's not good. So anyways, I go and do the errand. Somehow I made it. That was my on-the-job experience, right, learning how to drive. And I get back. I park the car. I go in, put the keys up, start to go back to work. Didn't say anything. Well, this guy goes, and he notices at his brake that his car's been scratched, and there's a huge yellow line down. He comes in. He's smoking mad for good reason. Goes to the manager. He goes, well, I asked Andy to do an errand. It must be him. So he, the manager, uh, this guy who owns a truck, a few other people. One of those people was my brother. My brothers actually worked at the same restaurant at the same time. And, uh, and, and, they all, and, and the manager goes, Andy, did you do that? Did you scratch his truck? I looked at him and I said, I did not do that. I didn't do it. He said, are you sure you're the last person driving? I said, I don't know about that. All I know is I didn't do that. Just bold-faced lying. Well, it turns out I lost my job soon after that, you know, which probably doesn't surprise you. My brother came to me afterwards. He goes, why would you do that? We all knew you were lying. I said, I just couldn't admit it. It's so hard to admit it. It's hard to admit when we're wrong. The Bible says a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. We need to admit when we're wrong. I mean, there's nothing that infuriates people more than when they know somebody's wrong and they won't admit it, whether it's a boss, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a politician. I mean, everybody knows hey, you're wrong, and you just, those words just can't come out. And it breaks community it, and certainly breaks your respect for that person. And so if we're going to build relationships with people, we need to be willing to admit, hey, I was wrong without throwing you know, uh, what they did wrong. Just owning it straight up. Look at this. It says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. God wants us to, there's a healing that comes. There's a, it, it actually makes community go from pseudo relationships, which means kind of surfacy, to deep relationships, with God, which God values immensely and the truth is we need that we need deeper relationships that comes from being real with one another being real with one another sharing really what's going on letting people into your life and owning up when you've messed up lastly practice surrendering your plans to god so often when it comes to our plans they're our plans it's my plan my dreams my goals my desires it's all about me I want what I want, and then when we come to Christ, we expect God, we don't check back in. These are what I, this is where I'm going. I've already got a lot vested into this is my direction, and then we expect God to endorse those, and when those don't happen on our timetable, or they don't happen at all, we get angry at God. God, you're not blessing this. You're not doing what I want you to do. Well, it just doesn't work like that. That's why the Bible talks about surrendering to God, surrender. God opposes everyone who is proud, but he gives grace to everyone who is humble, so surrender to God. LeBron James is playing great again this year. Killed it last night. I'm not a very good basketball player. If I was going to play basketball, I wouldn't want to play against LeBron James. I really wouldn't have a chance he, with him opposing me on the other side. If I was going to go to an auction, I wouldn't want Jeff Bezos there, you know, and, and if he wanted the same thing I wanted, I'm probably not going to get it, right? Like, zero chance. He can outbid me until the day, you know, is long. Well, you don't want God opposing you. He, he will win. And so he's, he's not just like he's upset or he's, something like that. No, he opposes you. So when we're prideful, we're actually setting ourselves up at odds with God. So praying, God, you know, do what I want you to do. I'm angry because you didn't. This is an opposition. That's pride is what it is. It's pride. It's what Satan got. He got kicked out of heaven for pride because he opposed God. Give yourselves to God and surrender your whole being to him. 
to be used for his righteous purposes. So this is what he's talking about is surrender. In other words, my goals, my plans. God, I want you to be part of my life. I, w- I want to be connected with you. I, I don't want to try to do this on my own. That's what it means to follow Christ. In other words, Christ is going somewhere. It's not like Christ follows me. That's not the plan. The plan is, is I follow Christ. Where are you going? The, the, you know, some people like to say, There's only, you can only have one number one. You can only have one number one. And if you go with that, here's what that number one is. Do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. That applies in every area of life, in every season of life. Do what God is telling you to do. We've done that whenever we've talked about money. We rarely ask for money, if ever. We say, pray about it. Do what God tells you to do. That's what we want you to do. We want you to do that when it comes to any part of your life. That's your number one. Jesus said this. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble. What is a yoke? Well, that's a fa- piece of farm gear, farm equipment, that goes around two, uh, two animals, like two oxen or two horses, and so they can pull better, they can plow better, they have more energy, more strength, they can do more, and it's not all the stress is on one animal. Jesus says, just like that, when you yoke yourself up to what I have for you, you'll find yourself doing a lot better in life. You won't have to do it all on your own. You'll have, you'll have God helping you and also guiding you. Because you can't just veer off and do what you want. You're, you're, you're doing this because you're connected with God. That's what it means to surrender your life to God. But then God promises to give us blessings and peace. He says, all who are humble themselves shall be given every blessing and have peace, have wonderful peace. This is what God's promises, instead of the stress, the fear, the worry, all the things that the world stirs up, and it's already in there. So they, all they have to do is, is, you know, stir it up, and it happens. That can happen with a person. You know, people that know you, they say, oh, they can push my buttons. I say, get rid of those buttons. Those buttons don't have to be there. You say, oh, yeah, but I've had those as long as I can remember. They, my parents had those buttons, so God says, I can give you every blessing and a peace that surpasses everything else. No matter what storms are happening, no matter what people say, no matter the angst of other people or the world around you, you can have a peace that supersedes that. That's God's promise. But it takes humility. You walk and say, God, I'm going to surrender my life to you. I need your peace. I need your pathway. Use me, God, for something in this life to make a difference. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. I want to pray you through four questions right where you're at. If you could just pray these. Just say, God, first this question, how quickly do I need to adjust to other people? How can I adjust when people's needs change, people's preferences? You know, it's frustrating when you feel like you're not valued or somebody changes on a dime you thought you were helping them and then it turns out that you know you said it didn't matter and it just like when you feel like you're just in an emotional indebtedness that never goes away god wants to fill you up so that regardless of other people's reaction your you you run on full you run on full because the truth is some of you are on empty right some of you are on fee. God says, I want to fill you up. I want to fill your heart. That place that used to be full of hope and now is empty. God says, I want to fill that again. How eager are you to learn and listen to correction? People that can see things you can't see. feels good. I don't know anybody. I've never met a soul that likes correction. No. And so we risk, we run the risk of living this life not learning a whole lot and then having a lot of regret. I want to invite you right now. Say, God, grow me in this area. It'll probably never feel good. But it doesn't mean
listening to other people. Tell me what I don't want to hear. Tell me what I don't see. I want to be a little better next year than I am today. How quickly do you admit it when you're wrong? Can you not even see it when you're wrong? Or you just don't want to admit it. You're feeling like you'll lose respect front of your kids, front of your parents, front of your spouse, your friends, your workmates, whatever. The truth is we really lose respect when we don't tell the truth, when we don't own up to the truth. And then we cover it up. We lie because we have a we're not secure in ourselves. We have a low self-esteem. This is pride. We have to have incredible every heart, every person who's listening and says, God, I want more of that. I want to walk with that kind of self-confidence where even I can admit I'm wrong. I might be rad, teased, dissed, all kinds of things. And I run the risk of somebody getting super angry or whatever. But God, help me to admit it when I'm wrong. How about this last one about surrendering? Is there any holdout, some area that God's, you've surrendered your life, but truth be told, there's some areas that he's not allowed in. You don't really want to know what he has to say about some stuff. That's not full surrender. That's pockets of pride. I'm going to invite you to pray a courageous prayer, a prayer that says, God, help me to fully surrender to you today. Can you do that? Say, God, today I want to fully surrender to you. Every part. I want to trust you more. I want to believe that you have blessings and peace that you're going to usher into my life. You'll trust me with a great assignment make a difference so that I can live a life with no regrets. If you've never asked for Christ into your life, just to come in, that you say, God, today I want to be a follower of you. Do that right now, right where you're at. It's not about joining the church. This is about you following Christ. And start out just right where you're at, in your mind, pray this, you can whisper however you want, just say, God, today I want to follow you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Forgive me for my sin. And then give me a fresh start. to get up when I stumble and give me some deep, authentic friendship built on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have, uh, uh, we're going to just take a moment and, and uh, worship in just a moment, but I have, um, uh, if you prayed with me, let me know about that. You can text me, say, no God, and you text it to uh, 704 If you have a prayer request, just put pray, and that way we can enter into prayer for you. We want to, uh, this is our our COVID way of getting, you know, we, we I want to know about what's going on in your life. And so we also have the programs we're still doing, but I know that that's sometimes inconvenient. you got to write your prayer request, let us know that you see Christ. On, there's a clear box, you can put that in there, but here's another way we're providing for you. If you want to give and support Vineyard, uh, you can text it 45777 and then put VCC and the amount. That's so important. And as we've talked about, these small groups, okay, online directory opens today. So you can go and you can be part of, an, a, of a small group. We're doing small groups here also. We're doing them in homes, but a lot of our small groups are happening here that we can make sure it's a clean, a safe environment 
We can uh, sanitize it. We have kids ministry, not just child care, babysitting, kids ministry. We're going to watch your kids and, and teach them God's word and encourage them. That's important. And we, we want you to uh, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Okay, just go to them and say, God, you tell me what to do. And then just do what God tells you to do. But that, I do ask you to do that. Go talk to God and see if he wants you today, this coming time, this coming semester, to be part of our small group. Okay, would you stand with me? We're going to uh, close, as I said, in, in, a, in a moment of, of, of worship. I like to do worship at the end because uh, it gives us a chance to reflect on what God's doing in our lives. Instead of just running into our car and going to lunch, take a moment. Let that marinate. Let that percolate in your life a little bit. God, continue to do this work in me. Let me follow you. Help lift me up when I fall down. That's our prayer. That's my prayer for you. Let's worship together.